So, John Matic, do you want to comment on John's presentation? Do you want to comment on John's presentation? Obviously, there was... Yeah, the, the, the comment I'd make is that um, there are lots of mysteries in the GWAS studies, uh, one of which is that uh, unless you squeeze the sponge very hard, you can't explain most of the observed genetic variation. So there are two factors here. One is that the SNPs that were discussed uh, are, are actually uh, polling ancient haplotype blocks that separated the, the two alleles, you know, the C or T alleles separated about 100 or 200 generations ago, since being peppered by mutations. So I think these haplotype blocks are uh, identifying loci that play a role in these diseases, but genetic effect sizes are very reduced by this blurring. There's also, and this is very early days, but now a lot of evidence suggesting there's epigenetic reach through from past generations, and uh, that's very, uh, the evidence is very strong in plants, and it's pretty good in animals now. So that may be a compounding factor as well. The epigenetics, can we measure? I mean, is that measurable? Well, I think we have to, to see. Um, uh, we do know that the value proposition for genomic information, even in the simple monogenic traits, is now very powerful. You can actually predict uh, who's at risk for um, you know, uh, susceptibility to viruses or to warts or whatever now based on genomic information. The genetics of that is being unraveled. Uh, we had a great lecture on Friday from, uh, from John Laurent uh, Casanova from New York on this topic. So the value proposition is there, how quickly and how um, effectively we can get into the subtleties of complex diseases and feed that back into improved therapies, uh, pharmaceuticals or treatments is, is an open question. So that's the message I'm taking from this, is that complex chronic diseases, which actually are the major burden of disease in communities like Australia, are not immediately tractable because you've got the complexity of epigenetics and complex genetic interactions and we're really... Well, I, I wouldn't be, be excuse, uh, the believing the GWAS stuff too early. I mean, the prostate cancer example is a great example. That's one of the most heritable of all human cancers. It's got a very high heritability index, and yet the GWAS people can't find the heritable factors. And then we now know by just like sequencing the genome that the heritable factors are things like p53 mutations and the mutations in cancer genes, and there's more than one. That's why the sequence... So you think deep sequencing is the answer here? Well, I think it'll, it'll, um, it'll uh, expose uh, the data in a much more uh, full way, and we can actually ask the question properly. Um, what, uh, just John Matic, is, again, you know, this, this um, ambition to match phenotype with genotype um, and do it comprehensively, we don't have any protection for genomic information in Australia. So the resistance is... You're going to do that. You're going to uncover stuff that's got implications for my family or my ability to get life insurance. Yep. And as you said, life insurance might take over the health insurance area because they're more interested in wellness, mm -hmm. but they're also more interested in minimizing their risk. And you're going to create that risk for individuals. What's, do we need a genome protection in, information, genome information protection act in could, Australia? Could I start with the life insurance industry and come back to protection, uh, Norman? Uh, uh, in fact, everybody's uh, preconception about this is turning out to be incorrect. The life insurance industry, both in the United States and here, uh, and I had conversations this week uh, with some of the companies, are actually now actively looking at the possibility of offering reduced uh, premiums for life insurance with a promise of no penalty for genetic risk, because having genome sequences de-risks them and the patients, because if you know you're at high risk for colon cancer, you're much less likely to die from it because you'll actually have regular checkups and surgical intervention will be effective and, and curative. So uh, I think and I'm hoping that the life insurance industry in this company, country will make the announcement, one of them will, that they'll offer a product which is no penalty for genetic risk and reduce premiums if genomic information is incorporated in their wellness plan, and that would be a very powerful statement. So on the, on the issue of um, genomic privacy, et cetera, um, I recommend everybody go back and look at David Weisbrot's wonderful report from the Australian Law Reform Commission uh, about a decade ago called uh, Essentially Yours Genetic Privacy, where he canvassed nearly all of the issues, and what he's had to say there is still very pertinent. And much of it hasn't been put into legislation. We need to do that. As the English uh, have told me, that the, the most important thing is not to lose the confidence of the public, and that's the first priority in terms of the protection of their information, but also their interests in their health care. So I think we've got work to do there as part of this journey, but uh, I think that's process rather than a, 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 you know, a blocker. So John, I tell you, the, the price of, you know, let's assume for a moment that John's argument that you know, GWAS is probably an old technology, 
as price comes down for deep sequ next generation sequencing, then that becomes a possibility. Let's assume that someday we can actually en masse measure epigenetic effects. What, what is the tooling up for the clinical population, for clinicians to actually start to be able to deal with this and capture innovation at the bedside as a, in an iterative way, rather than just sitting back with your knees crossed and you know, one day it hits you like a locomotive? There's no doubt there um, is a lot of uh, power in genetic information, and I think doctors will have to, starting with medical schools, be trained to understand, uh, nurses, uh, physiotherapists will have to understand um, genetic concepts, terms, um, all of that. So I think we'll have to ch start changing the curriculum in, in medical schools. Um, I, I think there, there's a difference that I see between cancer. I think cancer is definitely a genetic disease. It's, it's a mutation in the DNA, and there's no doubt that having that genetic information helps us choose therapies and uh, tell prognosis. What I see is clinically is that diseases like diabetes are different. I don't think diabetes is fundamentally a genetic risk. There are genetic predispositions, but we know that lifestyle has a huge impact. What people eat, how much they exercise, um, and, and part of my fear as a clinician is that we spend so much time on the DNA bit of it and understanding that instead of, and, instead of uh, channeling our efforts on actually changing diets, uh, social, change, whoops, social change to change the tax structure, that sort of thing, uh, to encourage better diets. Uh, if we can follow both routes at the same time, I think our patients will do better. I'll come to you in a second, John. Just any comments or questions, just raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you. Um, and if the person carrying the microphone could raise their hand when you go to, when you go to somebody with a question, that would be great. So I can catch it. So John, are we at risk of a deterministic approach here, coming to the point about complex chronic disease, where we say, well, there is a genetic effect, and we kind of backpedal a bit from the the fact that the environment affects our genes? Well, I think the the critical thing is the strength of the connection between genotype and phenotype. With conventional genetic diseases like uh, cystic fibrosis, it's very high. It's not 100%, interestingly. There's variable penetrance on all of these variations and mutations. So other factors, background factors, probably a mixture of genetic and environmental. So you're not going to report... So you accept John's issue is that you could actually make the wrong decision if the only information you went on was the genetic information? Uh, no, I don't accept that, but I do. I think the genetic information puts you in a better position to make an informed decision, uh, and then the environmental uh, it comes in on top of that. I think having a clearer lens on genetic variation underpinning disease susceptibility and disease progression will make it easier to isolate the environmental factors and make it easier for people to, to uh, follow uh, you know, mitigating strategies because they know there are increased risk. I make this sweeping statement, and there are exceptions, but... Just to make the point, I don't think anybody's going to get a, a complex disease if they don't have a genetic predisposition to that disease. But whether they get that disease or not is dependent on environmental factors. It could be a viral infection, could be obesity, whatever. Um, and, and just one quick, uh, I discovered, uh, that to, to my surprise in my genome sequence, that uh, not only am I a carrier for cystic fibrosis, no family history, so family history is not informative for recessive mutations, but I'm also B27, haplotype which is the haplotype associated with ankylosing spondylitis. And everybody who has that disorder has that haplotype, but only a small proportion of people with that haplotype get the disorder. So I escape whatever viral infection, whatever kick You're me a walking space. time bomb, Professor. I Mayer. am. <laughs> <laughs> There's no bad outcome. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you for a very positive discussion about genomics. Um, I just want to bring into the discussion something about the ethics um, and the moral debates about screening people who are well. Um, for, the ankylosing spondylitis is, an, is a perfect example. So people will then be worried for the rest of their lives. They're going to develop something that they maybe never were. And it's the risk of intervening. We, don't, we often don't know, particularly in breast cancers, which ones actually need intervention and which ones don't. It might lead us down a whole additional intervention path. I think there's a whole lot of questions in there to be thought about. Yeah, 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 no, well, there, you, there, yeah. there are, and uh, you know, it's, do you want to just recapitulate re 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 the question, just in case? Just my understanding, uh, as I understand it, is that, that um, we're going to fix this problem over lunch. With uh, giving ankylosing spondylitis being at risk, you don't know whether you need to intervene or not, and what you can intervene at all. So, and and uh, you get these variable penetrance problems. Yep. 
so, so, uh, so what to do? So I think um, there's you can't, not much to say, particularly to the patient, if there is no effective intervention, unless they ask for full disclosure. However, uh, you can advise the clinician. I think a good example of this is um, hemochromatosis, one of the most common and undiagnosed genetic diseases in our population. Major symp uh, symptom is lethargy. If the physician knows that the, uh, the patient is at risk for, or genetically uh, has uh, variants that would uh, indicate that, if they come in and say they're not doing well, they put them off to blood test to confirm. So in other words, it can be informative in terms of rapid diagnosis and, and, and consideration of treatment options in, in context-dependent ways. So, uh, you know, uh, perfection doesn't have to be the enemy of the good. So can I just ask then, as an enabler, so you've got the Melbourne, Melbourne Genomic Initiative, so they're already getting going with rare disease diagnosis to the children or children's and others in Qu Queensland QUT, I think in association Princess Alexandra is doing next gen sequencing. I think on the plan was everybody with cancer. The question is, what should the publicly funded system, as opposed to philanthropy, be doing at the moment to actually progressively move forward here again so that you're at the forefront without wasting too much money? John? <laughs> I know what dramatic view is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you have stronger ideas. <laughs> I guess we have to be cautious in how we spend taxpayers' money. Uh, and, and my fear is that we, there is so much to invest in in the health system that we don't jump in too soon uh, with some of the genomics. We, we know that intervening on lifestyle factors, um, sp stopping smoking, reducing alcohol intake, all of these things take money to do, and the impact on them we know are well documented and will, will be immediate. I think we should also invest on, on, genetic, on genomics, um, but I'm, I'm still not sure what form that will take exactly. Um, I think for cancer... So how long are you going to wait? What would be the sign from heaven that we should start? I mean, what are you waiting for? Well, I think the best predictor of future performance is past performance, and I, and I think cancer definitely That's a bit is, depressing. <laughs> ...is an area where genomics has, has proven itself. I, I think that's definitely a genetic condition. Um, I think investing for other complex diseases like diabetes, I think we're better off uh, with our public health approaches at the moment. Um, but I stand to be corrected if you... Well, no, I, I, I have... Um, uh, I agree with you that public money has to be spent very strategically and, and thoughtfully. Um, you could fund this entire program uh, in Australia uh, for uh, less than the cost of annual vitamin D testing. So let's uh, put that in context. The billions of dollars that go into health and I think everybody realises much of it is unproductive and some of it is just plain wasted, that the amount of investment required to get this up and running at a national scale is, is quite minor. I think you'll find the federal government is entertaining this as a national project and in uh, discussions... So this is going to be the NBN of cancer, is it? <laughs> it's not the best analogy, although I do... <laughs> I, I, I have advised uh, that a Category C Commonwealth Corporation like the MBN, is the ideal vehicle for this, like the Genomics England, which is wholly owned by the National Health Service in Britain. There's a lot to learn from what they've done there. But uh, it, it, they may announce it, and if they do, I think what you need to answer the question specifically is a, a roadmap where you say, okay, we accept that this is going to be a standard part of medical care because it's important. We're going to go to 100% of the nation. Where do we start? I think they're going to say 1%, and that 1% will be probably not much with kids or rare diseases because that's already standard of care or should be in the next 12 months. But people with chronic diseases, exceptional responders, well-characterised cohorts. Um, uh, so, so, if so, so that you actually got maximum health value and maximum demonstration value for your first investment. So how do you measure outcomes in that? I mean, I think... The clinical cancer registries that we've got, I mean, very slow. New South Wales was the first to have a clinical cancer registry. I think Victoria's got one. We're slowly moving towards that. But there, we, we can't get the data for years. I mean, we're, the data are old. How do we actually get prompt, kind of live data so you know that when you press the button on your Illumina machine, um, there's, you, can, you actually know what the benefits are in a, in a timely way? Yeah, we will. We have to invest in the infrastructure, and I think the Australian Digital Health Agency is probably the route to this, because the federal government's put almost half a billion dollars into bringing that up to speed. I personally like to see a little bit more interventionism, where uh, medical rebates are only provided to clinicians if they put the data in the appropriate formats and, and participate in this national database construction. Um, uh, a whole range of things you have to do to build this ecology. And I think a public investment for the public good in Canberra 
to maintain the databases that are required and will provide point of care, primary health care information to clinicians about their patients' status. Using all of this information is critical investment. Please thank the two. Professor Johns.